Thank you, Vinay. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking here. Um, and again, thanks to Ram uh, Raising a Mathematician Foundation for uh, having me speak. Um, okay, so maybe I will share my screen and then. Uh, today is, um, I'm, I'm Nitin, um, and today's topic is communicating efficiently um, from a computer science perspective. What we mean by communicating efficiently? How do you efficiently send a message across? So the dictionary definition of uh, communication is that it is the act or process of using you know, words, sounds, signs, blah, 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 to express or exchange information. So this is the crucial part. So, so you want to exchange information or you want to express your ideas, thoughts, feelings, et cetera, to someone else. This is the dictionary definition, right? One of the dictionaries. Now, today we will look at a kind of a broader definition. So here, communication, is kind of defined as between you know one person and another person. Here we will look at a much broader definition of communication, transferring any kind of information from one point to another. And you know these points could be people, they could be computers, satellites, many things, right? And let's see how people do it in practice. And there are several ways to communicate, right? So, you know the oldest way that humanity, you know, humans communicated with each other is simply by talking. And we have so many languages, right? Like there are tons of languages in different geographical locations that evolved simply because humans always wanted to communicate. You know, you have to, you have to tell another person what you're feeling. Maybe you want to convey that there is danger coming your way, or you want to transfer some knowledge. Maybe some, somebody hurt his arm and you want to Tell them, hey, look, here is this plant that you need to use, you know, to, you know, like to cure your wound or something, right? So humans used to talk. And then later on, like in the past 6,000 years or so, humans developed writing. They were writing on clay tablets. They used pictures to represent ideas, right? They used uh, pictograms or pictures or symbols to represent ideas. Um, and they wrote this down on clay tablets or parchments, or in, in India, I think it was um, mostly palm leaves, palm leaf manuscripts, um, and mm, much more recently, paper, right? Paper and ink. Then again, much more recently, in the past 200 years, we developed really fast methods of communication. So people could send, send letters before that. And not everyone could afford to send letters, right? And telephone revolutionized communication. Telephone or radio, like there, there are other modes of communication. I'm just listing a few. And in the past, maybe 10 years or 15 years, not in sorry, past 40 years or 50 years, um, we developed email. And now you all have smartphones in your hands and you can you know, send text messages to other people, WhatsApp messages, you can do video calls, lots of things, right? Um, by the way, there is a chat message. Um, I'll, I'll take care of that. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, you know, there are more ways to communicate. Can, like, maybe you can, uh, I, I want this to be interactive. So you can also share, um, you know, other ways if I have missed out anything. I'm sure I have missed out some things, right? Yeah, there is a raise hand, uh, Anushka. Yes, sir. Uh, for people who can't hear, who are uh, who are deaf, we can use um, sign language to communicate. Very good. That's a very good point. Sign language, right? Sign and for language. visually impaired, we can use braille. Braille, right? Sign language. Somebody sent uh, in the chat, uh, you know, Morse code, telegrams, telegrams TV, radio, Morse code. telegram, Morse code. It's good that somebody mentioned Morse code. So see that. Um, then TV, radio, right? So lots of means, right? And in some cases, it's one-way communication. In other cases, it's two-way communication, right? 
anyhow um so there is a raised another hand. issue that you yeah is, is it is it okay if i call out names when there are raised hands yes yes yes, yes. yeah arya the newspapers also uh, so i wanted to give another uh, example of ways to communicate so the computer cannot understand our language so there is yeah. a binary language of zeros and ones which helps it to understand our language yes yes definitely so that that's 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 a language right so um, language is one of the modes of communication right definitely yeah good um okay so now you know in communication brevity what is brevity does can can somebody tell me the meaning of the word brevity means anybody krishna yes short yet thorough gravity means basically the force that pulls humans down to the earth ah okay not gravity it's brevity right so gravity is like the force that pulls you down to earth right but brevity brevity means shortness you know short and concise and but short of oh. time so maybe you are familiar with succinctness succinctness or short you know brevity is shortness you know so how do you communicate using as few you know words as possible or as as little a message length as possible and this has always been considered desirable right this was humans always wanted this yeah so there are you know compactness quick conciseness to the point everything great and why was this desirable let's see hmm? so in the pre writing ages you know there were still books right so can, can somebody mention one book that was you know that has survived from pre writing times maybe the vedas the vedas very good so the vedas have survived from the pre writing times right so brevity you know shortness in texts made memorization easier the only way you could transmit a book or like a passage to someone else was if you actually memorized it and people developed sophisticated techniques for memorization and additionally they also tried to shorten the things you know so a book on medicine in a world where there is no writing you will have to make it as short as possible so that people can really learn it by heart and you know transfer it to other people right and and pass it down and yeah so this is one of the situations where brevity was crucial and then writing developed did that change anything right like was did brevity become suddenly undesirable no right brevity in writing resulted in smaller books and smaller books were easier to carry easier to copy from and you know it took up much less space in libraries so there was still an advantage of uh brevity right so um so in india in particular in india like the um, a lot of the old books were written um in uh, in, in metrical lines you know the, the was the poetry was very metrical and one reason is a metrical poetry um, is very much easier to remember than if you write in prose right so it's harder to remember prose it's easier to remember poems because you know it's it's there is a rhythm and then you can just remember by heart right uh so now so like one example i want to point out is um, that of panini panini is the father of modern linguistics so his achievement is that so this is a stamp that india government you know um published in respect for panini so panini was a sanskrit grammarian you know he wrote down a prescriptive grammar of sanskrit people say he was a sanskrit grammarian and his biggest achievement was compressing the sanskrit grammar so much you know he represented the entirety of the grammar rules in just 4000 rules and i think the number of words in paninian grammar is only 8000 or something 
And this was, this was an amazing feat. And again, the reason why they did that, you know, they, they really focused, the grammarians used to focus a lot on um, brevity, succinctness of ideas, because, you know, you had to remember, you had to copy. And this was a difficult task. So, um, so brevity was, you know, just the point is brevity was important in communication. And now the question is, is it still desirable in the modern age? You know, it's much easier to like copy a text. We can simply scan the texts or, you know, like there are uh, automatic, you know, so you can like you can, so th there is Google lens with which you can just simply scan a page and then it will somehow convert it into the text. Even for Indian scripts, it's quite good. And um, you have like the modes of communication, you know, email that really does not impose much limit on uh, how much you can send, right? Or so you have a like much better modes of communication. Is brevity still desirable? Hmm? So, any so there is a thoughts? message in the chat. Yes, uh, it is desirable. Yeah. Yes. Chat message says advertising depends on this. And okay. others, those who have raised hands, maybe you can just unmute quickly, Anushka. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I feel I feel brevity is desirable still in this modern age because the people have a lot of things to do, especially um the people who are working, students, and everybody has a lot of things to do. And if something is written in brevity, everybody can read it quickly, understand, and then move further in their life. So if exactly. something is very long, we'll have to spend a lot of time in it and we'll not get time to do other things. So therefore, brevity yeah. is still desirable in the modern age. Definitely, definitely, right? Now, uh, there is another kind of aspect of brevity, right? Um, and communication can also mean not just sending text messages, it could be sending images or videos, right? And you want these to be kind of small and there are good reasons for you to want uh, them to be small, right? And le let's maybe look at one, a couple of reasons. Um, so, okay. It is still important, and we address we are addressing this question, right? So you see, I don't know if you have if you have kind of encountered this problem. You know, while sending emails, Gmail imposes the, this limit of twenty five MB on the attachments. Yeah. Right? So there is yes, you know, sending sir. or receiving large files is a problem, and so here, so so the file that you are sending is actually something that you are communicating, and its size being large, this creates a problem. You know, you hit a limit there somewhere, right? Exactly, yeah. I'm seeing lots of great points for uh, on the chat. Like, you know, even though computers do a lot of our work faster, computational power is still precious, right? Now, another example is, you know, you want to download or watch a movie, you know? And your data budget is limited, right? You know, maybe you're trying to watch it on your phone data. And again, so it imposes some sort of limit, right? So you would ideally, like, you know, it wouldn't it be great if you could like watch, you know, if every movie, the size of every movie file was some something like 10 MB or something would be amazing, right? You know, with your one GB data per limit, you could have so many movies or like, I don't know, so many videos you could watch, right? So, and people work towards these things. People try to somehow make things shorter, make things shorter without compromising on the quality, right? So succinctness or brevity is still a very important issue um, in modern communication channels. Okay. Um, so now why are such limits there? Yeah, we even oh, use we uh, zip files. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Because we have limited data. Yeah, but uh, why sorry. do we have limited data? So, you know, it's, it's so this 25 MB is something that Gmail is imposing, right? And there's, you know, 1 GB limit on your phone is something that the phone company is imposing. Right. 
Like, why do we have such limits? May I answer? Yeah, yeah. May so I? I, uh, I feel that they are imposing such limits because uh, they need to earn money. If they give everything in free, everything, uh, no limits, then everybody can use it as much as they want. And this will maybe create some business issues. Yeah, that, 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 that's a valid point, you know, so the, the point is that the companies are doing it for profit, right? Yes, the companies are doing it for profit. Um, and I answer? Yeah. That I, that I think Google has, uh, like, Google, like, for example. Has, okay, uh, Omkar complete and then Raghav. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Google and all these uh, big companies have remote computers somewhere in the world. So mm -hmm. uh, when you are uh, using their services, you are basically uh, uh, processing some data on their computer. So they just want to save that data. Exactly. They don't want to use too much computation power, right? Raghav? Yes. Sir, uh, also, for example, uh, if there is a string in binary language, like mm -hmm. 101010, mm -hmm. we can, um, we can uh, compress it by saying like, it is 10 times 100. Okay. But, uh, and and so the most uh, compact and most information informationally full string will mm. always be random information. Okay. And, yeah. But there is going to be uh, a degree to which we can uh, make it concise. There is mm -hmm. always going to be some things. For example, there is a totally random sequence like pi. Mm -hmm. We yeah. cannot uh, communicate it without uh, making it more concise because it is totally random. And we, can, we cannot send it uh, concisely without losing some information. Definitely. So yeah, so this is a good point. So here, so you are talking about compression, right? So we will come to that aspect. So here, like we are thinking more about like the physical world. Like uh, Anushka, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to add that such limits are imposed because in our daily lives, everything that we use is, uh, is finite and there is a limit to which we can use things because uh, that's our nature. Like, for example, we cannot, uh, in, in the case of uh, um, renewable resources, there is only so much that we can manage to use. So finiteness is important and I, this is why I think such limits are imposed. Definitely, definitely, right? So nothing comes for free. That's the point, right? So all of you are trying to say that communication has some cost, right? There is some cost associated with communication in the physical world. And, you know, one aspect of the cost is there is an infrastructure that is necessary for communication to happen in the modern world. For example, there are these transatlantic, you know, uh, fiber optic cables that are laid under the ocean, right? And you need to routinely maintain these things. And you even the installation is very expensive, right? Uh, the another aspect is that the communication also entails some energy use. And all of this is costly. So there was a mention of renewable energies, you know, even energy sources, everything is finite, right? And the nature in some sense imposes constraints on how much we can do with the resources we have. So we need to be clever about how we communicate. So this all leads us again, you know, so how do we shorten what we want to communicate? How do we communicate something as succinctly as possible, right? So this, this is all just motivational stuff, right? Uh, just to kind of mention that this is really a crucial thing. Hmm? Okay, now, you know, we, we, there is also, you know, we, we met, so far we mentioned about, you know, communication between people, you know, sending emails, watching movies. There is also a lot much communication on a larger scale. For example, communication from satellites, right? So satellites every day send large amounts of data daily to their ground stations. And, and this data is mostly images of Earth's surface and is useful for understanding weather, climate, agriculture, urbanization, and maybe, maybe most importantly in the present context, climate change. So satellite data is very crucial in understanding climate change. And the amount of data can range 
up to you know 100 terabytes or more per day from one satellite and just to give you some feel like this corresponds to you know i don't know 470 to 100 hours of video or you know like some large number of digital photos right and the satellite has to send this to the ground to the ground station and how can it do it you know it can transmit these as you know like some electromagnetic radiation and it has to encode this information into in some format and send it as electromagnetic radiation and this needs some energy right so the satellite has to spend energy to transmit this much information to the ground now the energy of energy that satellite has is also limited because you know the satellites mostly get energy by the solar panels attached to the satellites and you cannot have you know as many solar panels as you want because this is going to affect the weight of the satellite you know like and when launching it it's going to be a problem so there are lots of other constraints and so this all imposes certain limit on how much uh, how many bits really precise to be precise how many bits can be communicated um, per day so we want to you know whatever data we have we want to kind of really just press it down into this limit and this is what computer scientists try to do have been trying to do one of the things right so what can we do to address this problem there was so sometime back there was a um, i think raghav was one who mentioned about um, you know compression so he raised a point about compression that also somebody earlier mentioned that we have to send things as bits of zeros and ones um, and raghav mentioned that sure then we can try to compress things compress this data stream and when things are purely random we cannot compress but here we are not thinking about random data we are thinking about you know very structured data images or things like that and we usually can compress so the main thing that computer scientists have been trying to do is to develop schemes for compressing data. So develop, develop methods for compressing data. And if this does not make much sense to you, don't worry. Uh, I will try to give you a analogy, which is not really communication related, but it, I think it's a good analogy, like to kind of explain what is compression and, and what do you mean even by compressing data, right? Okay. So let's think about the problem of transporting a bunch of chairs. Suppose you are a dealer, you know, some kind of wholesale dealer of chairs, and you want to transport chairs from location A to location B. You have maybe, you know, 100 chairs or something, and you want to transport chairs from location A to location B. What can you do? You can, you know, hire some trucks and transport these chairs on the trucks. You know, you could do several things. You could do this in multiple, you know, at least two ways. One way is to take a truck and put the chairs, you know, unfolded like this, load them onto the truck and send the trucks. So this way you can send at most, maybe, you know, eight or 10 chairs, depending on the truck size. Here you can, you are able to just send four chairs, you know, you're somehow fitting only four chairs, right? But what is a smarter way to do? You know, it's like, this, this looks trivial, but this actually has a really crucial principle. Hold the chairs and... It exactly, you hold the chairs. Keep right? them on top of each other. Right, right. Or Compress dismantle them way. and send, right? Dismantle them and then let people reassemble. So now let's... Instead of using listen. trucks, we can use other uh, transports which can transport larger, uh, which can carry a larger amount of chairs. Yes. Like, like a, trains yes. or aeroplanes. Definitely. But suppose you have budget restrictions and you know you want to go from one place in the city to another place in the city and you cannot afford to you know, put it on a train or maybe put it on a 
aeroplane, there are some constraints, and then you are forced to use trucks, maybe. In that case, you want to somehow optimize how you transport, right? Yes. Then we can yeah. dismantle the best them. way to. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Somebody was saying. Where is the way? You can store many chairs there. Sorry, I, I didn't hear you. I was saying that the best way is to dismantle them and then place the chairs. Very good, right? So you dismantle them or you fold them or something, right? So basically you don't send it as it is, right? You somehow try to compress it. So, you know, you can kind of compress things and then send many more chairs on the same truck, right? Keeping one over another. There are several ways, right? You know, kind of tightly packing these chairs onto the available space. Then you transport. So this way, you are able to transport many more chairs with the same cost. This is the crucial thing, you know, with the same cost, you have the same cost restriction, but you're able to transport many more chairs by compressing them. And today's talk is going to ask this question in the context of information. Can we do the same thing with information being communicated? And we will see what to do, right? So the goal is to compress your information somehow. You really compress your information before you communicate so that you can, why, why should we do this? So that, so that more info can be communicated at the same cost. Um, there is a question uh, that has uh -huh. come in the chat. Meanwhile, I'll just read it out. So will okay. compressing an important data have impact on its quality? Yes. So this is an issue that we will have to explore, right? So let, let's, let's wait to answer that question. Hmm? It can. So, you know, there are, you know, lossy compression schemes and lossless compression schemes. So let's, let's get to that. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? Are do are we all clear about the objective that we are going to discuss? Looks good. Yeah. Okay. And today we will, you know, just restrict ourselves to text messages. We did uh, like you know, we went very fancy. You know, satellites were sending images, videos, everything. But you know, let's try to play it simple and try to compress text messages. So this is one, maybe, so this is maybe one big principle that we usually use in computer science research or maybe even in other fields of research. You want to solve a big problem. You don't attack the big problem first. You try to impose assumptions. You try to simplify the problem, simplify the problem until you get a very tiny problem that you can tackle. And then, you use your solution, you try to generalize the solution by removing assumptions one by one. So this is an assumption that we can make, you know, what the data we have is just text messages. Okay. And we want to compress text messages. We will not bother about images or anything for now. Uh, for the talk, we will think about text messages. So let's, you know, uh, I will propose a very stupid scheme. Like, so back when I was in college, it was long back, maybe many of you probably were not born, I guess. Uh, so a, I had my, I got my first phone, like, you know, this Nokia, tiny Nokia phone and the keypads were tiny and it was very hard to type SMS. So then, you know, people uh, would like type in, like instead of typing proper, words, they would really compress the words, you know, people will say things like, you are doing something, you know, they'll do these kind of things, right? So they will maybe uh, remove lots of vowels. Hmm? And right? Yeah. Yeah. 
exactly so you, people used to use symbols so their abbreviations you know also like used to use other symbols to denote and so let's look at a simple scheme is to you know remove the vowels so let's see let's remove the vowels okay can i ask so, something yeah yeah go ahead is it the yeah. same thing as the telegraphs and telegrams right in telegrams also this this was crucial right so people sending a telegram was very costly so people would use omit some words you know people so maybe like mother sick come fast this would be like a typical telegram message right um so here you know we are this is just an arbitrary scheme that you know i cooked up that's all it's a simple scheme it's maybe very natural also you just drop the vowels in the words so what is written here you know i dropped all the vowels here happy birthday and merry christmas right happy birthday and merry christmas right um so there are questions um yeah i don't know is idk take care stc uh, how are you we can replace it as a or b Yes, TBH. Okay, yeah, there are abbreviations. Sure, right. Um, now, so this works well for this message, but does it really compress? The size did not really decrease, right? You know, so there was an extra letter here. Birth day. I saved two here. There, I saved one here. Saved one here. Christmas. You know, it's. I did not get much saving here, right? So this is not a good scheme in that sense. You know, it did not really compress much. So it has another problem also. Oh, this is not moving to the next slide. Yeah, it has another problem also. Okay, can somebody guess what is written here? Fruits and nutmeg something. Okay. No, not nutmeg. Oh. I just removed the vowels. At last, at the last, you are doing first, but they are, uh, huh. and the rest is rather. First, last understood, but they are, doing? but they are, and the last is what are doing. What okay. you, what. Mm -hmm. Once so, you know what you are doing, is the last. Yeah, once you know what you are doing, good. Like I, I would have. Can I try it? Huh? Fritters and nutmegs, uh, to for something first, huh? but they. Sir, uh, fritters are... are intimidating at first, but they. Uh... Okay, so you see the problem, right? You know, even with the simple scheme, first of all, it did not give you much reduction in some sentences. And some sentences, the quality was completely lost. You have no clue what this person is trying to say. So I can tell you what exactly I was trying to say. So exactly understanding problems. Or you also need, you know, a context to understand. So this word is frittatas. Frittatas are, you know, kind of an omelette, like a thicker omelette. So frittatas, and people guessed most of the words correctly are intimidating at first, but they are easy to make, easy to make, make once you know what you're doing, right? It's a really useless piece of advice about making frittatas, but still, you know, like maybe this person, the person who is sending it is giving an advice and this person is really, you know, is going to spend hours trying to figure out and once he figures out, he's much more angry because I wasted a lot of time and I got this useless piece of advice, right? So exactly. Also, several words can have same representation. You know, here itself, you know, could be no or new. So this simple scheme really fails remarkably. But we learned two things. What did we learn? We learned that there are two features that we really desire in text compression. One is that we want to get considerable reduction in length. 
in representation length, right? And the second is that we should be able to decode the original message correctly and easily from the compressed text. Do, do we agree with these goals? Are we all in agreement? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, great. So let's see. So rest of the talk, we will discuss a good scheme that is often used to compress text messages. And we will work through an example. That is how we are going to describe the scheme. I'm not going to just describe the screen abstractly. We, we will really work on a specific example and see. So one simplification um, that we are going to make for the talk, again, I said like, this is one thing that we keep doing in computer science. We try to keep simplifying. So we simplified to the case of compressing text messages, I'm going to additionally make an assumption that the messages you want to send are written using ASDFGH, okay, just six characters. I, I can have such a um, simplification. For example, suppose I'm, you know, one, one such situation would be, I'm actually transmitting DNA strings, right? And DNA strings um, use only four alphabet, right? A, C, G, T. So the message I'm, I'm sending is maybe, you know, a subsequence of G, DNA strings. So I, I'm sequencing the genome of, you know, a chimpanzee, and I'm very interested in this region of the genome um, that is kind of, that I think is related to some um, proteins um, related to, you know, aging, let's say. So I'm going to send this part to somebody and I want to compress this, right? So here in the genome thing, I'm only using four alphabet. Here I'm just using more, two more. So my alphabet is six has length six, you know, there are six characters, no spaces, okay? No spaces. Okay. So a message could look like, you know, something like this. And we will use this particular message and we will try to encode it. Okay, we will try to compress its representation. So the other uh, aspect people already mentioned is that uh, we don't send messages as it is. For example, how, how do you send an A? You cannot really send an A. You, you, all you can send is a one and a zero, right? On, off. This is all you can send. So first of all, we need to come up with some way to encode the message in binary, and then we want to see how we can compress it, right? Okay. Um, so there is, um, so maybe there is a chat message that to see have same dictionary on both sides, use only the position of each word in each one, communicate only the numbers, right? Decoded at the other end. But um, then again, this will depend on the size of the dictionary, right? So the dictionary could be huge, right? Dictionary, you know, the number of words could be very large. And this indexing can also then take like, so even communicating the index can be quite painful that way. Okay. But th there is a kind of a, not an ad hoc scheme. There is a more general scheme to compress and which is proven to be optimal, right? Um, so we were removing the vowels in the words, but not anymore, right? Uh, are there questions? So here I'm not going to remove the vowels. So the vowel scheme I mentioned was to, it was, uh, the point was it, it is not a good scheme. I wanted to highlight some problems with the vowel removal scheme. What were the problems? Can somebody tell me? May I? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we were not easily, we were not able to decode the messages properly and quickly. Yeah, very good, right? And Different also parts really... could have same representation. Exactly, and okay. also it, it did not give us much compression, right? But, but maybe may, may more major problem is mis, misinterpretation. Is more. So here we are going to think about like, kind of come up with a, dip, like 
general scheme. But you know, you are making some simplifying assumptions. Your alphabet, like your words are, or the whole text is composed of ASDFGH. And this is a message. Okay. Okay, so let's first try to encode uh, these in binary. Um, you, you are familiar with binary, right? So um, how can I, you know, how do people usually encode? So I have A, S, D, F, G, H, F, six different things, right? So if I'm using, you know, if I'm using the same number of bits to encode each character, how many bits will I need? Three, right? Three, three, right. So let's do that. So A can be zero, zero, zero. What can S be? Zero, 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 one, one, zero. Zero, one, zero. Let's go in the, you know, lexicographic order, right? Correct order. Like zero, 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 one. one. Right. And then D can yeah. be? Zero one zero. Zero, zero one zero. F. One zero zero. One zero zero. Sure. One zero zero. And G. And one zero one. One zero one. One zero one. And one one zero. One one zero. Sure. Hmm? Oh. Now, if I write, you know, so my message, uh, A S F D S S F. Maybe this message I can encode as zero zero zero. Zero zero one, uh, then one zero zero, zero one zero, zero zero one, zero zero one, and one zero zero, right? And how do I decode? Decoding is also clear, right? I will look at the first three bits. Ah, I see that it's zero zero zero. So then it should be A. Then I look at the next three bits. Zero zero one. Ah, okay. It should be S, right? So I can also correctly decode this way, right? So you know, very natural representation, right? Yeah, we missed out uh, zero one one, but see, we did not use all the possible three bit things because we only have six characters that we needed to encode, right? We don't need to use everything. We just need to use different um, encodings for each alphabet, right? So if there were eight characters, you know, A, S, D, F, G, H, maybe Z and X, then we would have used, used up all the eight uh, encodings, eight binary strings of length three. Here, we don't need to use everything, right? So this is some encoding scheme, right? So some way to represent these things in binary. And it's a good way, right? In the sense that, uh, no, we don't compromise on quality if we encode this way, right? Is that okay? There is no compromise to quality done. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. okay great. So if you have a text of K characters, like, you know, this kind of text, how many bits you will end up using? Three k bits. Very good. Three k bits, right? Three so, times the number of characters, right? Three k. Good. Because why? Can somebody tell me why? Because for each character we have three bits. Each exactly. character we have three. Exactly. And the question is, can we do better? This is a very you know simple, correct scheme, right? Well, one bit is not equal to one character, right? Three bits are equal to one character here because there are six characters, so, okay. So can we do better is the question? And yes, we can do better is what a computer scientist long ago like said, right? So it was done by David Huffman in 1952. He developed an amazing compression scheme. Uh, and he was actually still a student, a doctoral student. And so he was taking a course on information theory. Information theory deals with, um, you know, how much information is there in like, you know, 
in a text message or something. How, how what is the information content of a text message? And he was taking a course with you know one of the leading experts in the field, uh, Fano, and Fano like so. Huffman was a lazy person, and you know he had the option of taking an exam or solving a problem that Fano gave. It was an open problem, right? It was a research question that Fano gave to the class. So Huffman was very lazy. He did not study for the course. He thought he could solve the problem. He thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. You know, it was very close to the exam. He had not made any progress. And he decided, oh, maybe I should study for the exam. Started studying. Suddenly, uh, he got an idea and he came up with this like um, compression scheme, which is, you know, considered one of the best compression schemes. And then he moved away, like his research interests changed. He was into, I think, um, making kind of folded paper designs or, yeah. So it was a different kind of research that he was into later. But this is his first work as a PhD student, as a doctoral student. Um, so Huff, in Huffman's compression scheme, the first idea is to ask, whether every letter appears with the same frequency in your text message. So, and he observed that some letters occur more frequently than others. Okay. For example, in the English language, these letters E, A, T, S, N, H, I, O occur much more frequently than others. Um, I don't know if you guys play this game called Wordle. It's a game where you know you have to guess a word. So to maximize your chances of guessing the word correctly, it's good to make your first guesses with these most common like letters, commonly occurring letters. So his idea was to use fewer bits to encode characters that appear more frequently. Okay. Yeah, A S D F G H E R. They, they, yeah, it was for ease in typing. Yeah. So use fewer bits to encode characters that appear more frequently. Why does it make sense? Why this is a good idea? Yes. yes. Yeah. Can somebody tell me why this is a good idea? Yeah. So while if we keep all the characters to be the same amount of bits, then we end up using more number of bits for the characters which we use frequently also. So when we uh, reduce the number of bits or any anything which we uh, use for the frequently used characters, mm -hmm. then the uh, uh, message will be smaller. The uh, Right, right. Very good. That's the correct explanation. Um, and this was, you know, it's not Huffman's idea. It's a much older idea. So Morse code. Somebody mentioned Morse code. Uh, the Morse code also uses this idea, also employs this idea of using fewer, a shorter length employs this idea. For example, in the Morse code, E, the letter E, I think is denoted by a single dot. So it's Morse code is collection of dots and like, you know, these kind of things, right? In, the E, the most frequent letter in English language is assigned like a single character in the Morse code. Okay, so this was the first idea. So, you know, so this is the frequency table of the message that we want to encode. Now, A appears actually two times. Um, B appears, how many times? Five times. D appears once. F appears twice. Uh, G appears you know, six times, H appears four times. And I just represented them in percentages. So this is the count. Hmm? And there are total in total 20 characters here. Okay, in the message you want to encode. So what, you know, do you want to maybe make up some scheme? You know, so you, we said that we want to assign the least number of bits to the most frequent ones. So the, do, do people want to suggest some encoding scheme? For G, for example, 
maybe we can use a single zero, right? G is the most frequently occurring. We could also okay. do the same for H, which is the next most. Yeah. So what, what should we assign for H? the next most. One. So S, right? S is the S next is one. one. So what should we assign S? One. 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 Okay. One. And uh, what should we assign now the H? What should we assign H? Two. two. No, no, we cannot use two, right? We have to use yeah. binary, right? Binary. But you can use different length bits. Zero one. Actually, zero we one. cannot zero use zero. Uh, zero and one. Okay, why? Because uh, if we uh, give uh, any other, uh, like, for example, if we give zero one for D, it can mm. be SG. Sorry, it so can be G. One for D. Let's give zero one for D. Yeah. It then, can be GS2, right? Uh, like, exactly. uh, how can we assume that 0, 1 is D? Exactly, right? This is a problem, right? So, if I give, if I assign the 0, then, like, you cannot really assign anything that starts with 0 for anything else, right? Yes, sir. Is the problem clear? Okay. Yes, so maybe yes I, sir, so it is clear, but we could write it as blocks. Like we could write uh, zero and then give a space and then write one. Then give no, a but space, space is also, space need to be encoded, right? In binary. So space there is no space when you send more, it. Uh, data. Huh? Uh, one space also takes up, take up some amount of uh, data or something. It, uh, yeah, and space is really another character. Even though we don't think of it as another character, space is really another character. That's why we said, you know, we only have A, S, F, G, H, no spaces. So let's see, you know, like with this assignment, let's see, suppose, so suppose the message I get is 0101, okay? It could be two Ds. It could be D, G, S. It could be G, S, D could be GSGS, right? Yes, sir. There is no unique way yes. for me to understand what was the message sent. This is a problem, right? So we cannot simply just use this idea and assign arbitrary things, right? So, uh, yeah. So Huffman had a very clever idea. Let's see, you know, let's walk through his idea, hmm? what he did. So, you know, so, okay, sure. So, no, we, so you, we, we discussed your scheme already, right? And we, we saw why there was a problem, right? So Huffman's idea is, you know, it's very nice. So he was building some, some kind of a structure based on this information. So what he did is he, he took the least frequently occurring two characters. So, you know, here it's, let's say D and, okay, maybe D and A. So D and F is also fine because F and A have the same frequency. So it really doesn't matter which one we pick, okay? And he made a figure like this. You know, so he wrote A in a circle, D in a circle and wrote down the percentages underneath. And then uh, drew, drew a line, you know, drew, drew another blog, another blog around and connected it to A and D. And he said, so this blob is a parent of these two, and these two are its children, okay? So this is what the naming convention that he used. This guy is the parent and these two are the children, okay? It's the first thing that he did. Yes, sir. Then he, okay. So then he said that this parent really represents you know, A and D together. Let's call it AD. Hmm? And so he, okay. And then, so he, in the table also, he made a change. So the table, he combined the entries for A and D. So A was 10% and D was 5%. He added a new entry, AD, and wrote 15%, the sum of A and D, right? And then removed A and D from the consideration. Then he repeated this process again. What was the process? He figured out which two rows had the least frequency. 
So which one, which ones have the least frequency here in this new table? A, D, and F. A, D, and, and F. F, right? So there is A, D, that this was the A, D thing that we built already. Hmm? Then F also he wrote, like on inside a circle with 10% is the frequency. And he again, like drew a new blob and connected these two together, okay? Yes. And then now next step, what should he do? Which one should he combine? A, D, and F. Which A, D, and F. A, D, and F. 25. Right. So A, D, F will be 25%, right? The table is going to be edited like that. A, D, F is now 25%, right? 25% of the characters are from A, D, F, right? Very good. Then you can take now, it with H. Exactly. Now, Let's try to connect it with H. We could connect S and H or ADF and H. It doesn't matter. Hmm? So let's see what we are going to do. So we are actually going to connect S and H. Okay, so S and H, again, I did the same thing. You know, I drew this picture. I drew a new blob and connected S and H. Now I will again modify my table. So SH is a new entry. I removed S and H. Now I have three rows, right? And which ones are the smallest? A, D, F, and G are the smaller ones, right? So I will connect A, D, F, and G, right? So, oh, okay, it's the same side, okay. Okay, yeah, so I connected A, D, F, and G, right? So I, this is my A, D, F guy. And I connected that blob and the G blob to a new blob that I created, right? So now ADFG will have 55%, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. ADFG is going to have 55% and SH will have 45%. I will connect both, okay? But uh, again, I'm, I'm careful about how I connect. I'm always connecting the larger percentage to the right and uh, the smaller percentage to the left. This is also something I'm taking care of. Do you want me to walk through the construction quickly once again? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's, so we are nearing the end of the talk, so it's okay, we can, um, okay. So, you know, A and D were the lowest frequent, least frequent things, so we, wrote down A to the right, D to the left, because A has more frequency than D. Then created a new blob, called it AD. And we said that this represents both A and D together. And together they account for 15%, right? Then we connected, decided to connect AD and F, because they were the least frequent. But again, we have to be careful. AD, the 15% AD, you know, this is my AD. This is the 15% one. This has to be on the right and F has to be on the left, right? And so on and so forth, right? Then I connected uh, AD, F and S and, S and H, I connected again. S is more frequent than H. So S is to the right. But why can't you connect ADF and H? I could have. I could have. Yeah. It, it does not matter which one okay. I do. Okay. Okay. And I keep going. No, so I saw, right? And finally, we have this big picture. And this we call a tree, actually. Okay. This, so this kind of structure is called a tree. Uh, why? Because it looks like an inverted tree, right? This is the root of the tree. If you think of this as the root and these as the leaves, right? this looks kind of like a tree. It's called a tree. Hmm? And, you know, there, there is a parent and a each parent has two children. This is called a binary tree, in fact. It's called a binary tree. And there is a reason why it's called a binary tree. So after constructing this, what Huffman did you know, so, so now he has to, he constructed this beautiful tree, but why? 
there is a reason. So the reason is that he came up with an encoding on the basis of this tree. So for each kind of blob in the tree, if there is a line to the left, he would write a zero on the line. If there is a line to the right, he would write a one on the line. Okay, so what should be the uh, character here? So this one here, what should zero, be the character? Zero. Zero, zero, right? zero. Zero. And what about here? One. 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 Right? And here it will be zero. It will be one. Zero, one. Zero, one. Now, if you see from the root, there is a path to my G, right? And on the path, if I gather my, you know, what I've written, so like, there is a zero, zero on the path from root to G. And there is a zero, one, zero, zero on the path from root to A. All the characters are the leaves, right? And now there is a zero, one, zero, one to the D, zero, one, one to F, and one, zero to S, one, one to H, right? So let's see. So this is called the tree we said. And so, you know, so, okay. And this is the comp uh, encoding scheme that Huffman used. So, so zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. This will be one, zero, one. So G will get zero, zero, right? So did G get zero, zero? Yes, G got zero, zero, right? And what was the most frequently occurring one? Um, it was maybe, yeah, G itself, right? And kind of lowest frequency one was D. It got zero, one, zero, one. Also, D, you got zero, one, zero, one. So if you can believe me, I've written this correctly. Okay. Now, let, let's see how many, you know, how many characters, how, how many bits it would take. So this message has, 20 characters, okay, in total. And if we were encoding everything with three bits, encoding each with three bit, this, is, this was the simple scheme, right? Then we would use up 60 bits, right? Yeah. But Let's see how, how much will Huffman encoding take up? How much will Huffman encoding take up? So we know that how many times does A occur? We know that it occurs two times, right? A occurs two times, S occurs five times, S occurs once, S occurs twice, six times. Sorry, yeah. So now, a occurs twice. So 0, 1, 0, 0 will occur twice, right? When I encode this. So, so eight eight is going, right? So eight bits there for A in total. Plus S is occurring five times. And each time I'm using two bits. So 10 bits for S. D is occurring once, I'm using four bits. F is occurring twice, I'm using three bits, six bits. Plus G is occurring six times, I'm using two bits, 12. Plus H is occurring four times, I'm using two bits, eight bits. What is the sum here? Uh, 48. Uh, very good, 48. 48. So we did better than 60, right? We did much better than 60. Now, can we also, decode correctly. This is another question. So we got some improvement on the number of bits. Can we also decode correctly? So let's see. So what was the message? No. So ASS. ASS, ASS. Let's, let's just take a small part of the message and see if we can decode correctly. 
ASA is ASA. Hmm? So what will be the encoding of ASA is ASA? So A is 0, 1, 0, 0. So 0, 1, 0, 0. S is going to be 1, 0. Again, S is 1, 0. I'm writing the space simply so that I can understand. That's all. There is no space. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, and F is what? Zero, one, one, right? Okay. Suppose you get something like this. Hmm? What will you do? So you will actually take the Huffman tree, and so you will. So you have the Huffman tree. So you, the first one was zero, one, zero, zero, like, you know? So you start from the root. So the, okay, maybe the message I should copy. How do I copy? No, okay, sorry. Yeah, this is my thing. Shoot. Okay, I need to paste it here. So you can see the message and the coding, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the encoded thing. Okay. And if I get something, some bit sequence like this, half, you know, to understand what was the original message, I will start at the root. So I the first character is a zero. I will go to the left, zero, okay? Because zero is leading me to the left. Then it's a one, I will go to the right. Then it's a zero. Go to the left. It's a zero. Go to the left. I reached A. And then I don't I don't have anything further to go. So I will say these four characters represent A. Then I'll forget them. Then I look at the next one. Again, I'll start. Why we are, excuse me, sir. Huh? So while we are taking four at a time, how we will be understanding because there will be no space. We can take so zero. So we are not also. taking four at a time. Exactly. So we are there is no space and we are not taking four at a time. I will keep going until I hit the leaf. Right? This is what I'm doing. So starting from the root, you'll go until you hit a character. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So see, this is what I did. I went zero, one. 0, 0, and then I cannot go any further from here, right? So I, you know, oh, I okay. the first four characters are an A. Then, so are, are there questions? You, you can ask, you know, you don't. Okay. And then, okay. yeah, okay. So then I figured out, you know, the first four characters are A. Then I will again, you know, I forget these characters and then I'll start fresh. So again, start at the root. So one, I go here. Zero, I go here. So, oh, I found S, great. You know, I cannot go further, S. Do the same thing. So this also I'll figure out that it is S. Again, zero, one, zero, zero, I will figure out that it is A. And one zero, I will again figure out by this method that it is S and zero one one zero one one, I will figure out it is F. I do it correctly, right? This kind of code is called a tree code, no? A tree code. Because you are walking a tree and encoding and you're walking a tree and decoding, okay? And it has another very important property. It has prefix free property. Code. So, and the prefix free, free property means that no code word is the prefix of another code. So, see, so there is one zero here. Now, if you examine, no other code word will have its first two characters as one and zero, like one zero. There will be nothing. So, there is no ambiguity. Again, for Zero, zero, there is no code word, no, no code word that starts with a zero, zero. So there is no ambiguity. When I see zero, zero, I clearly know which one it is. I don't have to go further. I stop. Okay, so I hope I, this gives you some idea of the you know, clever things people have done, right?
Okay, sorry, there were questions I did not see. So no, that's okay. I, I I took the liberty to answer something. Okay, and okay. Others thank have you. Also answered. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, um, we won't have two ways to represent for yeah yeah Minai. okay that's your answer thanks uh, great uh, yeah so you know fi final remarks is that Huffman scheme is one of the best compression methods known uh, in fact you can prove that if you are encoding character by character this is the best you can do this is an optimal code in some sense it's an optimal it's really the best you can do in certain settings, optimal or like you no know, best. And so the proof is not simple. It is, but maybe not for a for this talk, right? Optimal um, in some settings. And are there questions? That's all. You, you can do a raise hand if you have questions. Uh, so there was one question that came in the chat uh, to which I just answered yes, that we will have the tree uh, with us when we are, or the computer will have the tree with it when it is decoding, right? Yeah, yeah. So both sender and receiver will have the tree. So it's how how will the computer know you know that it has reached a end point or a leaf? How will it know that it has reached a leaf? There has to be a uh, so a leaf does yeah. not have a child pointer, right? So each right. node in the tree. So if you look here, each node, internal node, has like you know two pointers, or like it has a right child and a left child usually. And if you reach a place where there are no child pointers, then you know it's a leaf. Then you know you are at a leaf. You are stuck there. There is no way to go further. Right? Yeah. So algorithmically implementing this is it's a it's a different question altogether, right? Because then, so then you have to think about how efficiently you can implement. That will require some kind of data structures. Because you know, how how do you even like figure out what is the each time you have to figure out the two minimum frequency blobs right how do you do that like the, the, these are all interesting questions and for which there are very efficient solutions yeah is there any proof for this oh yeah yeah these are these are mathematically proven but uh, i mm, okay yeah so uh, i can I can try to find a good resource and maybe share with Vinay that I could share with all of you. Yeah. Numbers are more than letters, letters, sir. It takes more space than letters. Sorry? Sir, numbers are more than letters. Then uh, letters take more space, sir. Uh, so here, maybe. letters are only 20, sir. But uh, when we write in numerical forms, uh, it takes on uh, 48 or okay. then numbers take more space than letters. Yeah, I understand your question. So the problem is that the, the only way we can send letters is via binary, right? So the, this is the only language that finally computers understand. It's all, everything has to be put into zeros and ones. So, like, you know, so I, I understand your question. So like there are only 26 letters, right? And maybe you are, so when we write on paper, it's much easier to write like as a, you know, so this, when here itself, when we wrote on the slide, the message ASSASF takes up very little space, but it's binary encoding, even with the Huffman thing it takes up, it looks like it takes longer space. But unfortunately, this is the only way we can encode any information. Everything has to be encoded into binary, right? There is no other way. And, and this is why, you know, like humans have other forms. We have higher abstractions, we say. We have, we can, we have like, this is why we use symbols. Uh, we use symbols to kind of 
reduce the length of what we write. But in communications involving computers, it's a different matter, right? Does that answer the question? Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. Joshua. Yeah, sure. Sir, the like, how do you represent like numbers? Okay, like, can you use like Benford's law, or is or are like all numbers like equally likely to come like in a sequence, unlike letters? So this depends on the specific message you are looking at, right? So in these situations, to use to be able to use Huffman coding both the sender and the receiver has to have some prior idea of the relative frequencies of uh, the various characters that are going to come up in the message. For example, like English language is a very good example here. You know, we said in English language, it's kind of well understood. Like what are the frequencies of each letter? So any text you take, you know, some random Wikipedia article, if you actually sit down, sit and count the number of characters, you know, and then make a frequency chart, it will most likely match with the general frequency chart for English language. So this is something you could look up on Wikipedia, you know, letter frequency in English language. So when you want to encode English language text messages using Huffman coding, you actually have a, you can do it very efficiently because you, both the sender and receiver know that it's an English message coming in. So, and they have both an idea of the frequencies of letters, each letter in the English message and you know, letter frequency in English. And if it is some numbers, again, there could be some patterns in the data. Maybe let's say uh, if it is like salary data, you know, let's salaries of lots of people. So we definitely know that there are going to be a lot of zeros, right? You know, like salaries, like, you know, like maybe base salary, you know, not the final salary. Base salary of an individual usually is expressed as you know some some thousand or some hundred or something, right? So there will be zeros will be much more frequent than others. Right. So so to use this, we need to have some idea beforehand about the uh, frequency. So this is one limitation also of Huffman coding uh, that. We need to have some idea of the relative frequency of letters and numbers. So only I like alphabets use Huffman's coding, but numbers don't. Yeah, they can also be, yeah. And there was a question, how will you represent space or paragraph, paragraph break, right? So these are represented as some characters itself, right? So um, line break or paragraph break, and I don't know if you have used C, it's, there is a special symbol that people who type the, the programming programmers use. And this is finally actually converted to some binary sequence. And space also has a corresponding binary sequence. Right? And words of different languages. So again, it's the same way. Like for example, if you take, um, if you want to encode Hindi, like, you know, the Devnagari script, like um, let's take, you know, so maybe I'm, I'm just, I'm guessing, you know, so there is maybe ma. Hmm? Ma could be probably encoded as 0, 1, 0, 0, something. You know, there would be some encoding. That's what I'm saying. There would be some mapping. So uh, especially for Devnagari, it's, it's more complicated because we have like mixed, you know, we have things like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if this is a valid thing, maybe, right? Or like, via. Yeah, like the, this is a bit more complicated to encode, but, but still there are only, you know, all these combinations will together come to maybe some thousand or two thousand, it's, you can encode in binary. You will have to use maybe 10 bits or 12 bits for a character instead of three or four, but, but you can encode. Kavin? Uh, sir, why the less frequent letter it should be on the left. Huh. So like just be consistent. That's all it. You can put it on the right also, but then like make sure you put always put the I less always put the number. higher on the yeah. Right. Because yeah. Omkar. Like online uh 
don't you usually use unicode uh, that encodes all the symbols right yeah so whenever so they unicode add unicode is an symbol, encoding they, scheme right yeah so whenever they add a new symbol do they have to uh, check all their previous symbols and add a new one so that it doesn't break the system yeah 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 it, it cannot create conflict so these standards are this the, a lot of work goes into you know designing these standards i'm not very familiar with this but i've heard that a lot of work has to go into because it's, it's not done by one single person it's done by a consortium usually okay because and they have to put a lot of thought though you know again like as you said what if new characters keep getting added this is not a good situation right so they they would have like you know, safety walls for these things can Joshua? we join two trees vaishnavi so do you mean like this you know so i have a tree like this and then i have another tree maybe like this can we join like i want to join them like this is that what you mean vaishnavi okay yeah there, yes there is yes you can you can join two trees definitely so you if know there is one more element of course huh if there is one more element of course yeah yeah if if you want to join you 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 have a way to join usually when you maintain trees you know um you keep in you know in the memory you will have a place that points you know that has the address of the root and for the other tree also there will be a place in the memory where you store the address to the root right and then you know you are going to create a new root so you are going to create a new node you will store its address somewhere and then this guy is going to have two pointers you know to its left child and right child so the left child pointer i'm going to set so i will look up here so there is some address here maybe a da, da, da. so i will copy that address to the left pointer which means the left pointer is going to point here again there will be some address here to the right pointer i will copy that here and then and then i will after this i will forget these two things so this is this is more programming than algorithms but it's it's definitely an important issue to consider so you, i think you will uh, if you take a c programming course you will learn these things in detail actually how to use pointers yeah i have a doubt yeah so uh, in a computer or a phone we are using many languages with a single uh, type uh, keyboard mm -hmm. so will there be different frequencies for each letter in different languages so a may not be the a in english will not have the same frequency as ma in hindi right 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 yeah it will be different for different even like okay. you know if you think about um western languages that use the latin script the latin script is you know the 26 character right like a b c d um so if you compare french and english the frequencies will be very different and even as a language evolves through time these frequencies change okay it's, it's not that english language so maybe the current frequency of occurrence in english language was not may not be the same in future yeah 500 years ago or something right yeah okay and okay so there is a question about how do you know that you have found the optimal tree is there a way to check so if you design like a coding encoding by i hope you meant the coding right joshua did you yes, ask sir. okay yeah so so huffman actually proved um using you know, so gave a mathematical proof that if you construct your tree this way uh this is the optimal tree so like um so it's it's uh, so he actually argued that you cannot pack information more concisely so you can be guaranteed that if you do the huffman's algorithm um to build a tree you will actually get the best encoding Uh, yes sir yeah yes the optimal tree should have the most common letter in the shortest path very good yes there are the questions